أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي على في توحده ودنا في تفرده وجل في سلطانه وعظم في أركانه الذي لا يدركه بؤد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود فطر الخلائك بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميضان عرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد محمد تب القلوب ودوائها ونور أبصارها وعلى أهل بيته الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطاحرهم تطهيرا صل على محمد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن مثل عيسى عند الله كمثل آدم خلقه من تراب ثم قال له قن فيقون الحق من ربك فلا تكن من الممترين فمن حاجك فيه من بعد ما جاءك من العلم فقل تعالوا ندع ابناءنا وابناءكم ونساءنا ونساءكم وانفسنا وانفسكم ثم نبتهل فنجعل لعنة الله على الظالمين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات اللهم صل على محمد First of all we thank almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us with this great and wonderful moment, wonderful opportunity tonight. Been a very, very important night in the history of Islam and in the history of mankind in general, being a night where Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to guide our beloved prophets on how to lead the ummah towards the right direction. And plus this night, we're going to, inshallah, officiate the marriage between two families and I have no doubt in my mind this marriage was scheduled for today because of these events which took place in the history of Islam on a night and a day of this nature. That is the night of Mubahila. Inshallah my discussion of tonight will be of three stages and I'm going to depart from this verse which I've just quoted from glorious Quran. The verse is the verse from chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran, verse 59 to 61, where Almighty Allah discussed about the dialogue that transpired and took place between Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and the Christians of Najran. So the first stage of my discourse will be to look at the event in a very brief and short manner, and then we look at certain lessons that we can learn from that event. And secondly, still, under the lesson that we can learn from this event is to look at the concept of unity from this particular verse of Quran and the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And last but not least, departing from the same verse, we will look at the contributing factors towards successful marriage. Because when you look at the verse, you realize that family came together. So if a family is coming together, then there are a lot of lessons that we can learn about successful marriage from this particular verse of glorious Quran. Now let us begin with our examination. Tonight, as we mentioned, is a very, very important night for especially we Muslims who believe in the prophethood of our beloved prophet, peace be upon him and his family. It is important in the sense that when you look at last week, which was the 18th of the month of Zilhijjah, something happened in the history of Islam. And on the 24th, which is tonight, something is also happening that tells us how Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, loves our beloved Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam. On the 18th of Zilhijjah, Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, in Quran, commanded our beloved prophets to reaffirm the appointment of Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. And that came in the verse of Quran, 
ويا الله تبارك وتعالى سيد رسول الله يا ايها الرسول بلغ ما انزل اليك من ربك فان لم تفعل فما بلغت رسالتك والله يعصمك من الناس that is on the 18th of the hijjah tomorrow being the 24th of the hijjah what happened is called the mubahila what is mubahila this name mubahila came from this verse which i've just quoted from glorious quran It is a verse number 61 of chapter Ali Imran. You know for sure our beloved prophet when Allah tabarak wa ta'ala sent him with this message. He sent him and told him try as much as you can to reach every corner of the world. Therefore you realize Rasulullah he would send a letter to the king of a particular tribe. He will send letter to a leader of a particular family. He will send letter to a leader of a particular city. Some accepted the message of Rasulullah and others did not accept the message of Rasulullah. Others came forth and challenged Rasulullah on the message which Allah tabarak wa ta'ala sent to him. One of the teachings of our beloved prophet which all of us shared in common as Muslims is that Isa the son of Mary is a servant messenger and a prophet of God and not God as others may claim so rasulullah taught the world like that that isa is a messenger like me and isa is a messenger like adam but some of the christians especially from southwestern saudi arabia a place called najran those christians of that area they refuse to accept that isa is a prophet and a messenger of God. To them, Isa is a son of God. And Rasulullah taught the ummah, God is not needy. If you say God as a son, then God is needy. And if God is needy, then God is not independent. And if God is not independent, we cannot worship that God. Rasulullah taught them, Allah Almighty is necessary infinite. And he taught them in each and every necessary infinite there is no pluralism in it but those people still refuse the message of rasulullah when they refused they came to rasulullah in madinah al munawwara when they came to rasulullah they came to tell rasul that we do not accept that isa is not the son of god we believe isa is a son of god then Allah revealed unto our beloved prophet inna mathal isa inda allah kamathal adam khalaqahu min turab thumma qala lahu kun fayakun allah reveal unto prophet because they were arguing ya rasul allah tell them indeed isa the like of isa is the like of adam allah created isa from clay When he created him from clay what did he say say corn be for your corn and he was And Rasulullah told them if you say Isa is a son of God what of Adam because Isa has a mother but Adam had no mother and father so therefore the best person to be called the son of God is Adam and not Isa because he has neither mother nor father But those Christians of Najran refused to accept the message of our beloved prophet then allah revealed unto prophets another verse faman hajjaka fihi min ba'd ma ja'aka min al-'ilm faqul ta'alaw nadu abna'ana wa abna'akum wa nisa'ana wa nisa'akum wa anfusana wa anfusakum thumma nabtahil fa naj'al la'nat allah ya al-kadhibi If they refuse to accept that Isa is a messenger and prophet nothing to worry about ya Rasulullah I'm revealing a verse unto you and this is the message in that verse whoever comes and argue with you concerning Isa faman hajjaka fihi min ba'd ma ja'aka min al-'ilm after knowledge has come to you after Quran is been revealed to you after the explanation you've rendered and they still argue that Isa is a son of God don't worry what do you have to do fakul ta'ala nad'u abna'ana tell them you Christians of Najran 
There is no problem. But my Lord is telling me to tell you. Nadu Abna Ana. Let us call our sons and you call your sons. Wanisa Ana. Wanisa Akum. You bring your women and we bring our women. Wa Anfusana. Wa Anfusakum. You bring yourselves and we bring ourselves. What do you do then? Allah said, Thumma nabtahil. Then we make abtihal, mubahila. What is mubahila? Because you challenge me. We've discussed a lot. And you're not ready to accept. And I am messenger of Allah to the universe. So the best way to solve the problem and to get to solution. You believe in yourself? Yes. I believe in myself? Yes. Let us bring our children, our sons, and our women. You bring yours and our sons. What do we do? Then we curse the liar. Then we ask Allah to remove his rahma from the liar. So now these people, I want you to listen very carefully, brothers and sisters. This is the first lesson I want us to deduce tonight before we go to the question of unity and marriage. They went back home, they did their homework, and they came. But when they were coming for the first time, they did not come together. They sent their top leaders to come to Rasulullah. And they said to them, when you go, watch out who Muhammad is bringing out for Mubahela. Watch out. Who is he coming with? Because his Lord is telling him, come with your sons, we come with our sons. Come with your women, we come with our women. And come with yourself, we come with ourselves. Now when they came, here is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Muhammad. Prophet came out of his house. Rewaya said on that day, Hussein was very young. He could not walk because he was very, very young. We have two versions of the Rewaya. One Rewaya said he could walk. So the Rewaya that said Hussein could walk, Rasulullah, when he came out, Hassan was on his right hand and Hussein was on his left hand. And behind him was his daughter, Fatima to Zahra. And behind his daughter, Fatima, was his cousin, Ali, alayhi salatu was salam. The other riwayah that said Hussein was very young. It said, Rasulullah held Hussein here on his chest. And he was holding Hassan. And then Fatima behind Rasulullah. And Ali behind Fatima to Zahra. Now when Rasulullah came out and those Christians of Najran saw these faces coming, they came close to Muhammad. This is a very important historical event that I want to urge one and all. When we go back home, let's do our homework on this event. Because that is one thing that brings all Muslims together. That is Rasulullah and his family. Now when they came and they saw Rasulullah coming with these five people, they said, let us wait a little bit. The leader went to Rasulullah and asked him, who are these people that you are coming with? Then Rasulullah responded by saying, I am coming out with the best of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they asked him again, but there are old people who have a lot of experience. Why are you bringing, not bringing them? You are bringing these young ones. Rasulullah said, those that are bringing, they are so dear to me and dear to Allah than any other person. Now the leader who was leading the Christian said, no. Let us go back and inform our leaders and see what will happen. They went back to Najran. When they went back, the leader asked them, what happened? Did you do the Mubahila with Muhammad or no? They said, no, Muhammad came out with some people. Light is illuminating from their faces. And the way I saw them, this is the messenger telling the leader, if they would ask Allah to move mountain from one point to another, Allah will move it within a twinkle of an eye. Then the leader said, if that is the case, he brought his family then we cannot go ahead with Mubahila. Therefore, they had to settle with what? They had to settle with agreement and pay some dia and jizya, and they concluded the event. But what I'm trying to say here is that when you look at this event of Mubahila, it is a very, very important event 
to, to the extent that we all know Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala wanted to prove in this particular verse that Rasulullah is proof to the Ummah, Ali is proof to the Ummah, Fatima is proof to the Ummah, Hassan and Hussein are proof to the Ummah. They are hujja to the Ummah. Because the question is, on that day, Allah said, let's bring our sons and you bring your sons. There were millions of sons in the world. Even in Medina, in Mecca, there were so many sons. But why Rasulullah only took only two sons? And for those of us who know Arabic, Abana'ana is not Muthanna, it's not dual. But Rasulullah only came with only two children. Some scholars ask why he could come with a lot of children, hundreds of children, thousands of children. Why he came with those children? He said, no, this is according to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah sanctioned it. And Allah commanded Rasulullah. The same thing Allah said, one is Anna. We bring our women, you bring your women. But Rasulullah came with only one woman, Fatima to Zahra. And there were so many women there. He could come with a lot of women. But why he came out with only Fatima to Zahra? This is according to the decree of Allah. And last but not least, we bring ourselves and you bring yourselves. He came out only with Ali. To tell me that Ali is the self of Rasulullah and Rasulullah is the self of Ali. Some people ask question, why is like that? We said, Rasulullah yantiku anil hawa in huwa illa wahyin yuha. Rasulullah doesn't do anything out of his women desire. It is wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore the lesson we learn from the event of Mubahila number one. Is that whatever transpired on the 28th, 24th of Zilhijjah, in the 10th year of Hijrah, with the Christians of Najran, it was according to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's go to the second examination and stage. When you look at these events, there is a lesson we learn, which is the lesson of unity. Unity amongst mankind and unity amongst Muslims. Because unity is not limited only to Muslims. Unity of humanity is very, very important. And when you look at this verse, it explains clearly how important it is to dialogue with people. And at the end of that dialogue, you don't become enemies to one another. You rather love one another and keep in touch with one another. Now let us discuss a little bit about unity based on this particular verse. When we discuss unity, there are two areas we look at it. Islamic unity and general unity. When we talk of Islamic unity, two definitions are there for Islamic unity. Religious unity and social unity. So scholars said when we talk of Islamic unity, it is defined as having two components. Religious unity and social unity. What is the religious unity? Lend me your hearing. There are two definitions for religious unity. One of them is wrong and the other one is the correct one. The first definition of religious unity, which is wrong, is that you'll find today we have a lot of mazhab in Islam. You have Shafi'i, Ambali, Maliki, Hanafi, you have Ja'afari. Sometimes me as Ja'fari, I will come to you. I want us to be united but on one condition. You ask me, I'm Maliki, what is your condition? My condition is that you stop doing some of the things you are doing in Maliki, then I will join you become united. Oh no, you as Maliki, Shaf, you come to me. You Ja'fari, you want us to be united, no problem. Stop hitting your chest in Muharram, then we become united. Here scholars said it is a wrong definition of unity. It is not a good way for me and you to unite whereby I sacrifice some of my teachings and necessities or necessities in my religion. That is not unity. Philosophers, psychologists in Islam, they came and said, this is not a good definition of unity. I cannot call you for unity to expect you to do away with some of your teachings. That is not unity. The second definition of unity is the most important definition. What is that definition? They said, let's all come together, look at common ground. What do we share in common? 
Those things that we share in common, let those things bring us together. And the best thing that we share in common is Prophet Muhammad and Isa Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam. That is pivotal in uniting the Muslim Ummah. We all share Prophet in common. We all share Ahlul Bayt in common. There is no Muslim who doesn't love Ahlul Bayt. There is no Muslim who hates Ahlul Bayt. This is the best way to unite Muslim Ummah. Isn't it, Prophet, in most of his teachings, he said, I leave two weighty things for you, the Quran and Ahlul Bayt. And another way said, the Quran and the Sunnah. All riwayah are okay, but Sunnah cannot talk. Sunnah needs someone to teach it. Therefore, you bring the two riwayah together, Ahlul Bayt, Sunnah, and Quran. That is what Muslim Ummah can get united under. Therefore, this is the best definition our scholars, both Shia and Sunni, offered. That Rasulullah bring the Ummah together. Once we take Rasulullah, we will be united. And one example is this ayah of Mubahila. Because it's direct from Quran. Leave every riwaya, leave every hadith, just come to Quran. We all share Quran in common. Maliki, Ambali, Shafi'i, Hanafi, with all our sect, Shia, Jafari, whatever, we all share Quran in common. Chapter Ali Imran, verse 61, let us come together under that verse, and we will be united until the world is wrapped up. And the second definition is social unity, which is very, very important. Social unity is required by Muslims. And this social unity has three or four major components. The first one is husnul mu'amala. This is a very passionate advice to myself and to all of you brothers and sisters. Husnul mu'amala. Good way of interaction with one another. All Muslims must interact in a good way with one another. And I give an example. You know, in the Ja'fari Mazahab, we have Imam, the Sif Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. Masalli ala Muhammad. He beautifully explained about social unity. When he was addressing those people who follow Ja'fari Mazhab during his time. He looked at them and said to them, If someone comes to you or you meet someone who is not of the same Mazhab with you, then he start to outline what you should watch for. Number one, Imam Jafar said, is a sadaka fi hadithi. If he or she is truth in what he or she says. Wa hasana mu'amalatah. And his interaction is very fair and good. Wa adda amanata. When he or she is entrusted, giving a trust, is able to look after the trust and bring it back. Imam said to those people who claim to be his lovers and Shias and Jafari, be with those people. Eat with them. Spend time with them. Do things with them because they are your brothers and they are your sisters in faith. The same thing, 11 Imam, Imam Hassan Askari. He said, Sallu fi asha'irihim. You Jafari people, make salat in their mosque, perform salat in their mosque. Yani the mosque of those who are Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, this Imam Hassan Askari. Go and make salat there. That mosque is your mosque, and your mosque is their mosque. Wahdaru janazahum. When they have a janaza, go to their janaza. You are all Muslims, you are all believers, attend the janaza. Washhadu lahum wa alayhim. Witness for them and against them. Iza fa'altum zalik fa'adha adabu ja'fari. If you do that, this is what qualifies one to be ja'fari. Therefore Rasulullah said, ad-dinu mu'amala. Religion is mu'amala. So therefore we need to interact with people. 
We need to interact with one another. We need to be united and the kalimatu la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And that is one thing we learn. Number two component of social unity is that we should stay away completely from accusation. Stop telling this one kafir. This one believer. This one is embattled. Rasulullah said, if you say to a believer is kafir, one of you will die as kafir before you leave this world. She asked, you don't have a right to call anyone kafir or else you, you, will del you will be delayed on the day of Qiyamah. Likewise, my Sunni brothers and sisters, we are all believers. We are all mu'minin under one umbrella. So therefore, number two component is that Adam will estefazaz. Don't accuse. Don't label people kuffar. Don't say what you are doing is haram. This is shirk. Leave everything in the hand of Allah. Allah mentioned in Quran, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَزْحَبَ رِيَوْكُمْ Do not argue amongst yourself or else you will fail dismally. And when you fail, your strength and powers will go astray. Therefore, Ja'fari, Imam Ja'fari is teaching me and you brothers and sisters that we should be together our Malikis, our Hanbalis, our Shafi'is, our Hanafis, our Naqshabandiya, our Qadiriya, our Umawiya, our Tijaniya, you name all. Let's all be together under one umbrella and Allah will shower us with his mercy and Rahmah. The third component. We should all know we have one common enemy. We should unite together against that enemy. What does Allah says? Inna shaytana lakuma adu fattakhizuhu aduwa. Shaytan is indeed your enemy. And regard and consider him your enemy. So therefore, Shia is not an enemy to Sunni and vice versa. It's just ideological differences. Which you can come together and move forward. Because our Rasul is a Rasul of Rahmatan lil alameen. Therefore, the third component is that we come together against one enemy. Therefore, Allah call me and you. وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعَتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةِ وَمِنْ رِبَاتِ الْخَيْرِ تَيْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَضُوَ اللَّهِ عَضُوَكُمْ Allah said, you believe in men and women. Prepare your strength and power against your enemies and the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, I laugh and jiggle when I see Shia attacking Sunni and Sunni attacking Shia. Because it's one thing at the same time. You cannot call me kafir. I don't have the past to call you kafir. Last but not least, component of social unity. I, let's assume we are not even Muslims. Shias think Sunni not Muslim. Sunni think Shia not Muslim. We are human beings. We share humanity together. Your make is my make. And her make is your make. We have one make. We don't have two make. Isn't it Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Ali, when he sent his messenger Malik Ashtar to Egypt, this I urge all representatives of people, you must read the letter of Imam Ali, which you gave to Malik Ashtar when Malik Ashtar was going to become an ambassador in Egypt. He told Malik Ashtar, when you go, you will find in Egypt two kinds of people. Akhullaka fiddin wa akhuka fil insaniya. You have, you will have your brother in faith and your brother in humanity. You may not share the same faith. We are not Muslims, but we are human beings. And that is very, very important. If alone at all we are not Muslims, Allah, we are human beings. And that is our identity. We have to be under one umbrella. Therefore, you see these Christians of Najran, when they went to Rasulullah, Rasulullah never shouted them, you are wrong, you are kafir. La. Rasulullah gave them home. He gave them everything. Drink, uh, food, everything. He welcomed them nicely. He respected them. Then he dialogued with them. And he called them for Mubahila. In a very nice way, humble way. Isn't it Allah when he sent Pharaoh and Musa? 
Uh, when he sent Musa, excuse my word, and Harun to Pharaoh, what did Allah say to them? Idhaba ila Pharaoh inna hu taga. Fakula lahu kaula layina la allahu yatazakaru au yaksha. Allah. Pharaoh claimed Uluhiya. He said, I am Allah. Ana rabbukum al a'la. But Allah, when he sent to Musa and Harun, he doesn't say, go and crush him, go and destroy him, go and call him kafir, go and belittle him. No. He said, you, Musa and Harun, go to Pharaoh. He has exceeded the limit. But when you get there, talk to him in a humble way, in a nice way. Maybe he will go back to his senses. Are we Pharaoh? Are you fair out? No. Therefore, unity is very, very important. Last but not least, when you look at the verse 361, we learn about successful marriage. And tonight we are here to witness the marriage of our brother Osama and our beloved sister. You see the unity of purpose between Ali and Fatima al Zahra. We learn about marriage from this event. Therefore, I'm going to outline some of the contributing factors to a successful marriage. Beginning from the life of our beloved prophet, is Ahl al-Bayt and true sincere companions. And it will serve as a lesson to my brother here who is getting married tonight and the sister and all of us who are still in marriages. You see, when the marriage of Fatima to Zahra was contracted, Normally, when the marriage is over, the lady will be taken to the house of her husband. They took Fatima to Zahra to the house of Ali. Next morning, everybody will be curious or after some days, how is she? Is she a good lady? Is she how, how? So now Rasulullah, the next morning, went to Ali. And he asked Ali, how is your companion? How is your wife? This is the first lesson to all of you, especially my brother Osama. Then Imam Ali said to Rasulullah, Look at it. Allahu Akbar. Wrong footing destroy your marriage. Good footing makes marriage very powerful and successful. When Rasulullah asked Imam Ali, he gave him one word only. He said, blessing be on an assistant to the worship of Allah. It means Fatima on that night, she was a pillar and she helped Ali to continue to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your marriage, my brother Osama, must be for the sake of Allah. Get into this marriage sincerely to please Almighty Allah. Let Allah take charge of that marriage. Isn't it when they brought Khadija, the wife of Rasulullah, to Rasulullah? And you know Khadija had wealth with her. When they brought Khadija, Rasulullah came to Khadija. And then Rasulullah started explaining to Khadija about deen and Islam. Now when Rasulullah explained everything to Khadija, you know Khadija had a lot of wealth. Then Rasulullah asked her, of course we all know Rasulullah had to work for Khadija at certain time. All this world, what is going to happen to it? Khadija said, me and the world belong to you, Rasulullah. Everything belongs to you. Because Rasulullah is divine. So she gave everything to Rasulullah. So therefore the first lesson we learn here is that one contributing factor to a successful marriage is Allah. Put Allah in your marriage. And you will be successful indeed in your marriage. That is number one. Number two. Husnul mu'ashara wa tafahum. Portray good conduct. And try to understand your wife. And wife shall try to understand the husband. The wife is not malaika. And the husband is not malaika. They may be wrong at certain times. But if you understand one another, then Allah will help you and the life will continue properly. Therefore, the second contributing factor, according to Rasulullah and Imam Ali, 
husnul mu'ashara proper way of dealing with one another allah numerous verses said deal with them with kindness deal with them in a good way likewise you want to be dealt in a good way in a kind way but when there is no husnul mu'ashara it become a problem third contributing factor ihtiramul mutabadil mutual respect husband respect wife wife must respect the husband don't expect her to respect you and you don't respect her it doesn't work out that way you respect her she respect you you don't respect her then it's a problem so therefore rasulullah mentioned whoever respect his wife or whoever respect his husband allah will build a place for them in jannat al firdaus so therefore respect is very very important number 3 الاهتمام وعدم الاهمال concern and do not ignore show concern don't ignore wife show concern don't ignore your husband husband show concern don't ignore your wife because rasulullah said innaha sharika wa laysat bikahrimana because this lady she's a partner in life and she is not a servant and a slave in life so therefore you want to be successful you want allah to bless it what do you do show concern don't ignore her and the same to wife don't ignore your husband show concern to one another and then the fifth one the fourth one is is a harul hubbi wal mashair show a lot of love and emotions rasulullah said if you say to your wife i love you one day that will make a miracle when there is a problem with the marriage is harul hub show love but sometimes we want women to show us a love and we don't want to show love to them therefore somebody came to imam jafar as-sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam he asked imam how do i approach my wife in terms of meeting her discussing talking with her Imam said beautify for her the way you will want her to beautify herself for you. Not you come back from work the dirty clothes you come from work you sit in and eat in the lunch and then you talk. Is harul hubb wal mashair. I keep on repeating this we are all equal in this journey. You are not better than her she's not better than you. Only Allah knows who's superior. So let's do away with the mindset of I'm superior than my wife or this one is superior than the other. In the terms of Allah's teaching, we don't have something like that. And number 5, qaddi haqqiha, give a right. A woman has a lot of right on you. Likewise, you got right on her. Don't demand your right when her right is not given to her. Then Allah will question you on the day of qiyamah. give her right the way you want your right to be given to you number 6 which is lacking in most of our marriages today which i said it some time ago and i'm repeating it again encourage one another to love allah encourage your wife to love salat she should also and there are people when they get married then the ibadah go they sing completely And there are people when they get married it goes high but in most cases you don't see a husband telling wife salah ibadah allah allah and you don't see wife telling the husband allah ibadah only the wealth the bank account the credit card how much do we have what is the shopping this thing is lacking in the house that is what you hear therefore we are facing with a lot of challenges and problems in our marital affairs call her to allah like the way ibrahim made dua rabbi ja'alni muqim as-salah wa min dhurriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua ibrahim made dua allah make me among those who establish salah not only establish salah myself ha wa min dhurriyyati and my family also therefore sama is your duty to call your wife to allah make your marriage a source of bringing you very very close to allah don't make your marriage a source that takes you far away from allah because according to islam 
If marriage will take you far away from salah, from ibadah, then you, have not, you are not successful in that marriage. The same thing the seventh one, not only calling them to salah. Ask Allah to soften their heart to love salat. Make dua for her. وَأَمُرْ أَحْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاءِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Allah mentioned in Quran. لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْكَ نَانُ نَرْزُكُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ Allah said. Allah said, you command them with salat. Tell them to do, make dua for them. We will not ask you of the wealth of this dunya. We are those who are providing the wealth to you and them. Wealth is from me, I provide. So your duty is to what? Save her from entering fire. You have a role to play. And the wife should save you from entering fire. When Allah said, Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourself and your family from entering fire. Who are doing in this marriage today, really? Who are doing it? You see, husband and wife, they can plan their holiday one year in advance. But they don't plan Ramadan one year in advance. <laughs> This is the reality we are faced with today. And Rasulullah taught us. You don't hear them planning about Eid, how should I have been to love Allah? And of course, last but not least, which is a factor, very important. Don't ask her what she cannot afford to do. How? Because sometimes you go to certain houses, Wife is, uh, is left to do a lot of work which is beyond her control. You do not do that to your wife. It is totally against Islam. Look at the, wa the marriage of Imam Ali and Fatima al-Zahra. The household work was shared equally between them. Ali would go out and bring water. And Fatima will grind things in the house and cook. When there would be no water, Ali would go out and bring water. They shared equally their wife's work. So therefore, don't expect your wife to do more because that's not her responsibilities at the end of the day. And the same thing, my sister, don't expect him to do more than he cannot afford because the time you find a lady, when she sees a friend wearing a certain clothes, she also wants the same clothes, whereas the husband cannot afford. We cut our coat according to our sizes and Allah wa ta'ala will help us. Therefore, we make dua. To ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to bless the marriage of today, insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brother Usama, who is here to get married with the sister, we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to make it easy for them in the journey that they are embarking tonight, insha'Allah. Whatever will be difficult for them, we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to ease it on their behalf, insha'Allah. Whatever will be easy for them in this marital journey, we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to continue to make it easy for them, insha'Allah. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين